We do have another caller on the line. We have William from Texas. William? Should we consider Hades and Earth to be one in the same place? So could the point be made? What does verses 17 and 18 mean? John the Baptist? Not Christian. Great question. Great question. Good evening and welcome to GBN Live. I'm Mike Hickson. So glad that you're with us tonight. We are so grateful for the opportunity to be with you. We're going to be discussing the Christian's responsibility to vote. And we hope you'll stay tuned for the next hour. You might want to give us a telephone call tonight. You can reach us at 888-805-3390. You may email us at gbnlive at gbntv.org or tweet us at hashtag gbnlive. We'd love to take your questions tonight as we deal with this very, very important subject. And tonight as we begin our program, let me introduce our guest. We have with us tonight B.J. Clark, and B.J. has been with us on a number of occasions, and B.J., so glad to have you. Good to be here. Also, we have Dave Miller with us, and Dave has been on the program before, and we're so grateful to have him with us tonight. And Dave, thank you so much for being here as well. Happy to be here as well. As we begin tonight, as we talk about the responsibility that we have as citizens in this country to vote. And I think about the great blessings and freedoms that we enjoy in this country. And I guess the question I have is why would we not want to vote? Because it is a privilege. And there are two things that we can do as members of the body of Christ when we talk about the direction of our country. Number one, we can, we can use our voice for good. A second is we can vote. So as we, as we begin tonight I, I, and, and think about some of the privileges and blessings associated with voting, I read recently that some 93 million people failed to vote in the last presidential election. And somewhat surprising to me, and yet we talk about the spiral of our country and what can we do. B.J., why do you think there's such apathy among voters today? I'm sure there are many reasons. I'm sure part of it is people are weary of hearing all these promises that are made and we send people to Washington to try to get some things done or to stop some things from getting done and then nothing happens and sure. people roll over and play dead and don't do anything at all and people just get apathetic and uh, don't think that their vote matters and so they quit trying and that leads to a lot of complacency. So. But as a Christian, because we've been commanded to be light and salt uh, we really can never stop trying to influence our culture. In the great Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ said, you're the salt of the earth, verse 13. Mm -hmm. And then he says in verse 14, you're the light of the world. And we're expected to be a preservative like salt is to try to keep our culture as moral and righteous sure. as it can be. And we're supposed to spread light in a world that's growing darker and darker. I think so. John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one or is engulfed in spiritual darkness. And so we do have a responsibility as Christians to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And, and you think about our country. And, and I know, Dave, you've done a lot of extensive research on uh, the history of our nation. And don't, don't you think the failure on the part of a lot of people to vote is symptomatic of a greater problem in this country and, and the idea is people just don't care. And, and is it the case maybe that sometimes we fail to realize how blessed we are until we lose those blessings? Absolutely. Well, and see, the more, the more disgusted and, and frustrated we get, as B.J. pointed out, uh, the more people drop out of the process, well then that leaves in the process the very people that are going to put in people that we don't want. That's right. And mm -hmm. we happen to live in a country that's very unique in human history. Because if you lived under a monarchy, a king or a queen, you didn't get a, a say in anything. If you live under a dictatorship, you don't say anything, get to say anything. But uh, the founder said, God has blessed us, Providence has blessed us with the opportunity to govern ourselves, to have right. a say in that. That's right. And so if nothing else, good Christian stewardship would say, use your opportunity to have input with the government and political forces where most people in history have not had that opportunity. I think that's well said, and I appreciate what both of you gentlemen have said. B.J.? I was just thinking something that Brother Miller just said. I've heard some people argue that because we don't live in a theocracy like they did in Solomon's day and other, that those verses are somehow not pertinent to us that say righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But I think the reasoning is backwards. If that was true then, it's still true today, isn't oh, sure. it? 
And if they had lived in a time when they were allowed to go to the polls, so to speak, and elect their leaders, then indeed this should have been on their minds. And you remember when they clamored for a king in the first place, it was uh, because they weren't listening to what God's righteous principles were. And so the righteous kings that stand out uh, were unfortunately few and far between in the southern kingdom. And in the northern kingdom, as we all know, they had not one good king. And look how rapidly their destruction came about. And so you can't tell me that leadership doesn't matter and whom we select to be leaders doesn't matter when you see how much it mattered between Israel and Judah. Yeah, I think so, B.J., and, and I'd like maybe to get some input from Dave as well. When, when you look at the cradle into which the Church of Christ was born, the Roman Empire, mm-hmm. and, and obviously the Roman Empire was a corrupt, ungodly empire, and yet Christians in the first century radiated as lights in the world. And you think about the tremendous good that came about as a result of New Testament Christianity. We talk about the plight of women in the first century and the fact that Christianity raised the bar. Slavery, another major issue, and yet what was it that led to the eradication of that? Well, again, Christianity. So if it worked then, won't it work today? Sure, absolutely. And as I said, we have the opportunity to to exert some influence in the political arena, which is so unusual. Uh, B.J. pointed out that a lot of people th- think that, you know, well, under the Old Testament, people didn't have that much input. Well, they did before they clamored for a king. God didn't really want them to have a king. You know, when Samuel came and complained, they don't like me. And God said, it's not you, it's me. That's they don't right. want a king. And so that's, right. that's that got them into trouble. But prior sure. to that, there was a lot of discussion about um, qualifications of leaders. You know, for example, uh, there in Exodus 18, where Jethro... Uh, Moses' father-in-law, who clearly is articulating the same views that God would express. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he gives specific qualifications, you know, men that hate covetousness. Don't we need that among our political leaders? Absolutely. And men of truth, they won't lie to us, they'll tell us the truth. Uh, Able men, in other words, how many people are we putting into office that we don't even know what their qualifications are, whether or not they know how to run a government or do anything. We have other criteria that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the big one, fear God. That's right. That's right. In light of the voting process, as a Christian, what is my responsibility? Should I vote? Should I not vote? And especially in this day and time, a lot of folks really don't have a lot to choose from by way of character. And and there are things that we don't know. There are things that we do know. But I know a lot of people, in light of the candidates that are before us, really are struggling. And, and so, what is my responsibility as a Christian? And, and what issues should I be looking at and saying, you know what, this is the deal maker for me? Um, if you're asking me, if you do not vote, then you have voted. You, you've exerted influence whether you like it or not, and I suggest it'll be in a negative way. Mm-hmm. But Christians, you know, uh, B.J. pointed out earlier that, that <laughs> have, we, have we ever voted for New Testament Christians, no. So we, we always vote for the lesser two evils when we're dealing with political officials. True. But when you look at the circumstances that we're facing, when you look, for example, at uh, the fact that in the last several years, probably 30 years, the U.S. Supreme Court has exerted an influence over our country and our culture and our laws that none of the founders intended. I mean, none of them, You're whatever right. their disagreements. Well, we don't like that, but here we are. Therefore, if Christians have an opportunity to exert influence on future appointees, which will alter the course of, of our nation literally perhaps for 50 years if we get it too far to the left, I think so. then if your vote can assist that, then I would say if you have no other reason to vote, that sure. is a critical one simply because of the impact that, it, that will be made by the, the future justices. Absolutely. B.J.? I completely agree with that, and I was thinking about it. I've heard a number of people say that, you know, well, we don't need to be thinking about voting. We need to be thinking about evangelism. It's really not either or. First and primary mission of the church is always going to be evangelism. And as a Christian, my job is to spread the gospel, no doubt about it. But let's stop and think about this. True or false, the arena and the atmosphere in which we attempt to evangelize 
can have an effect on whether our evangelism is uh, law-abiding or whether it's against the law, whether it's going to be as well received as uh, it could be and should be. And frankly, there are some on the liberal side of things who are trying to systematically take away our freedoms as those who practice what the Bible teaches. And so the people that we elect and the people they appoint to the Supreme Court are going to determine the atmosphere of evangelism sure. that comes in generations to come, whether we're allowed to oppose Islam, whether we're allowed to oppose it uh, in the arena of ideas. And that's how sad things have gotten. They don't even want us to debate with them in a reasonable, rational way about what's right and what's wrong because that's already automatically viewed as hate speech. Just to ask a question, just to call for evidence is being labeled as hate speech. So it's, uh, there's a lot of factors involved in this. And for those who are watching who believe that evangelism is the key to a lot of this, and I do too, because if you, if you convert homes one at a time to the church, to the Lord, to Christ, to His gospel, to the righteous principles of this book, then sure, you're going to take the country in the direction it ought to go. But why can't you do both at the same time? Evangelize and also, to the best of our ability, elect officials that will preserve the atmosphere of evangelism that will enable us to do even more. Well, and I think in addition to that, trying to influence people that are in positions of power. For example, when the Apostle Paul was in a Roman prison and wrote to the church at Philippi, and he used that influence while in prison, and yet when he sent greetings to that church or closed out his letter to the Philippians, he talked about those who were saints in Caesar's household. Mm -hmm. and, and so you think about, can we have an impact for good even among those who are politically uh, in, in high positions of politics? Yes, we can, and we ought to. Well, and keep in mind uh, kind of an addendum to what B.J. is saying is that when we say we ought to focus on evangelism, well, certainly that entails the death, burial, resurrection and converting sure. people. But the doctrine of Christ extends so much further than That's that. Right, so when we champion and fight for the cause of Christ in terms of, for example, protecting babies or in defending the biblical definition of marriage, right. we are promoting Christ's cause well, yeah, and evangelizing. Well, you know, right. you mentioned just a moment ago the Supreme Court and, and the nomination of future justices. Okay, in 1973 we had Roe versus Wade and since that time we've had, what, 59 million babies aborted in this country. Now, if that's not reason for us to stand up and oppose those who are pushing this, and, and then you think about same, same justices, in other words, the, they were Supreme Court justices, but you think about they legislated or gave, gave freedom in this country for gay marriage. And so if, if, if we have, you know, abortion and now homosexual marriage, what's next? Absolutely. As if those are not enough. You know, looking, uh, being acquainted with God to the extent that we're able from His Word, the God we read about in the Bible, that one issue of abortion, you know, from His perspective, our streets all over America are flowing with blood. Everywhere. And all the other issues that are facing our nation, you could set all of those aside. On that one issue alone, it's astounding that He has not already called our nation to judgment. Which begs the question, is God not going to hold us responsible? For 59 no, million no innocent babies. I mean, who do we think we are mm. that we can run roughshod over the laws of God and not expect some type of punishment? And yet, future? how many Christians are voting, not based on those critical moral issues, but on, well, how's this going to affect my Social Security and my pocketbook? And right. what's this going to do to my retirement and so forth? That, that's a shame. And well, and, and when I think about going into the voting booth and, and in light of who's running for president, if for no other reason, if you want to make, if you want to make a prudent choice, vote for the babies. Mm -hmm. Vote for the preservation of human life. You think about the sanctity of human life and what the Bible has to say. Aren't we to, to be defenders of human life? Are we not as members of the body of Christ the pillar and ground of the truth? And so it's not always voting for a candidate as much as it is sometimes voting against the bloodshed and the slaughter that another candidate is going to bring in tenfold or a hundredfold more than uh, the other candidate would. That's right. Got a caller on the line. Corey Collins is with us tonight. Corey, good to have you on the program. Thank you. Appreciate so much the blog that you do, and I read just recently some of the things that you said about the voting process and 
the person for whom you would vote in the next couple of weeks. What, what kind of response have you had to the blog? Well, I've had thousands of viewers to the blog post and a number of comments. Thankfully, most are very supportive and positive, and they've been sharing that message with others. I, 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 thought, I, I thought the way you described the candidates who are running for president, I, I thought you were very objective and unbiased, and you simply painted really sadly a, a very, I, I think, a, the correct picture of both candidates. And, and you talked about some of, the, some of the things that would prompt you to vote. Could, could you maybe let, let some of our viewers and listeners know what some of those things were that, that would prompt you to vote for a certain person? Sure. I always look, as I'm sure you men do, for a high moral character and integrity and honesty. And if I don't find that at the top of the ticket in either case, I look for other factors because I don't want to fail to vote. And I don't think that other options would be effective in terms of writing in someone or taking another uh, position. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at the second uh, lower, uh, the vice presidential nominees, and realized in the one case you have uh, Mr. Pence, who is very open about his desire to follow Christ, his love for the Bible. And in that vice presidential debate, when he mentioned Christ and quoted scripture and applied that to abortion and other factors, that helped to uh, solidify with me that if someone should have to step into the role, uh, if the president should uh, be taken out for some reason, I had confidence that Mr. Pence uh, would be a good choice. Then I looked also at the two platforms, and you've already alluded to some of these things, but those unborn babies, one million every year, I want to vote for them, and I want to vote for marriage, one man and one woman, and I sure. want to vote for a Constitution-based Supreme Court sure. that will take us back to the founding principles of our nation. And these are some of the concerns that were on my mind as I thought about the decision that I would make. I, 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 and, and listen, I think what, what you've said is well said. And I think that you have done a good job of articulating reasons why you will vote in a certain direction. And, and, and hopefully and prayerfully, those who are watching our program tonight will give due consideration to those who are who are running for president and will look at the heart of the issues. That's right. I certainly hope so because our nation is at stake and the path we've been going, uh, we're all concerned about it, praying about it. Uh, First Timothy 2, uh, 1 to 3 tells us to pray for those in authority so that we as Christians might lead a tranquil and quiet life and all godliness and dignity so that the gospel can spread as you've been talking about. I think so. Well, if you look at First Timothy chapter 2, the reason we pray for those in authoritative positions is so that we might continue to enjoy the freedoms that we have, particularly uh, our, our Christian freedom or the freedom that we have to, to worship, to serve God without any fear of outside hindrances. I believe that is what is at stake. Hey, Corey, uh, if our viewers wanted to go and read your blogs, where would they go find it? They can search for me by name, uh, Corey Collins, and uh, they can find my blog there. It's on Blogger. Okay. Appreciate it very much. Corey, thank you so much for calling in tonight. Appreciate uh, what you're doing, and uh, I think you did an excellent job uh, in, in the blog talking about uh, the issues and, and uh, the whole voting process. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you tonight. I appreciate God you. God bless. You too. God bless. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, sir. Bye. Sir. What, what are some of the personal characteristics, characteristics and virtues that people should look for in a person running for quote-unquote president? Well, as we mentioned there from Deuteronomy chapter, uh, or from Exodus chapter 18, honesty, you know, the they won't lie. They're not caught repeatedly in double talk and trying to correct previous lies that they have told. Uh, they should have some sort of spirituality about them, you know, a fear so. of God. I mean, it, you know, this is not rocket science. We understand we want people of integrity, good sure. moral people. But here's a thought that you fellows uh, I'm sure have thought of, but uh, something I'd just like to, to express. We might be assuming 
that God should put a Christian in as the president. Well, that may not be God's will because he has used many people in human history providentially to do many things, oh, sure. even though they themselves will not be saved. And in some cases they were scoundrels. Mm -hmm. You know, I think for example of uh, some of the Bible characters, look at Samson. Mm -hmm. I mean, Samson was a, you know, kind of a brash, uh, a uh, fellow who was very weak spiritually, unbelievably so, but God used him yes, politically mm -hmm. to bring about certain changes in the environment of that day. I think of uh, Jehu. Uh, Jehu was a bloodthirsty fellow, and yet God said, I want you to go wipe out the entire posterity of Ahab, just mm -hmm. exterminate that house. And I think of people like, in history, like how about uh, General George Patton? Now, if you were a Christian living in the 1940s, you would think this guy is foul-mouthed. That's not Christian. That's right. He's arrogant. He's braggadocio. Mm -hmm. But do you not think, you know, I realize we don't have a prophet to tell us, but looking right. back over history, he was a providential figure at no a critical time in American history. Well, do we not have a brash, you know, braggadocio type, you know, loud mouth uh, person that we have a lot of concern about? Sure. Well, yeah, those are not Christian traits, but that's not necessarily what God might be doing in this situation if in fact there is a concerted effort to try to pull the nation back from the precipice of where we have gone. We know, we know what the element's been doing now for a number of years. Mm -hmm. They've been promoting, as we said, the, the killing of babies. That's right. They've gone mm -hmm. so far as to ensconce into law a redefinition of marriage, unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And now they're pressing hard for transgenderism. You know polygamy is right around the corner right. and several other perversions. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. And what about socialism? You know, our people are just, well, what's that and what's wrong with that? Because our schools have been teaching that it's okay, but it's anti-biblical, it's anti-God, and it's anti the American way of life. Well, there's a reason for us to vote, just for that one issue alone. In light of what you just said, and, and I know that in looking at some of the qualities, characteristics that God looked for in leaders in the past. What about our founding fathers? Mm. We, we think about their deep and abiding respect for God. What would they have to say about where we are at this juncture in the history of this nation? We're 240 years in. So what would they have to say if they were alive today? Well, I'll tell you, I, I hate to say this, but I, I think they would say, hang, hang it up, it's too late. You, you've gone too far. They would be horrified to know uh, where we've gone. But let me just read you uh, a quote or two. Um, what about uh, Noah Webster? Let it be impressed on your mind that God commands you to choose for rulers just men who will rule in the fear of God, the preservation of a republican government, that is we're a republic, not a democracy, depends on the faithful discharge of this duty. If the citizens neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, the government will soon be corrupted. That's kind of prophetic, isn't sure it? Sure is. Laws will be made not for the public good, so much as for selfish or local purposes. Corrupt or incompetent men will be appointed to execute. Execute meaning the laws, you know, that which is really the role of the presidency. The public revenues will be squandered on unworthy men. Is that not a, a good 18th century description of welfare? And the rights of the citizens will be violated or disregarded if a Republican government fails to secure public prosperity and happiness. It must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands and elect bad men to make and administer the law. So our leaders are a reflection of our population to some extent. No doubt. Got a, someone on the line. Ben Estes is with us tonight. Ben, good to have you on the program. Uh, hello again, Mike. You know, it's good to be on the program again. Uh, my uh, my little comment for tonight, you know, Brother Dave had mentioned earlier uh, about how Christians have the responsibility uh, to not just look at the critical issues, but, you know, in every issue, you know, how is this going to affect my Social Security and you know general stuff like that, That's right. but in re in reality, it's not just people Christians that have that responsibility. It's every registered voter in general. Although a pattern I've seen, you know, people uh, basically just vote, you know. If, if a candidate says they're going to do what they want, you know, mm -hmm. 
uh, what the voter wants, sure. you know, and uh, it it's really sad that this nation has come to that, and that the whole system has come to that. Uh, I heard a quote a couple of weeks ago. I guess it was there in church, uh, where if uh, if the presidents of the past, the good ones like Abe Lincoln, if Abe Lincoln was able to know what you know the political system had come to today, he'd be the oldest man in the world because he he would have died. And, 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 uh, sure. sure, and I appreciate, I appreciate you calling in, and, and, and I agree with you that there is more at stake in, in terms of this election than just the economy. And I think a lot of people have this attitude, what, what will I get out of it? And, and there are deeper issues at stake here, and so uh, hopefully and prayerfully people will uh, wake up to, to the state of our country. And you mentioned Abe Lincoln just a moment ago, and Brother Dave just, just seconds ago quoted Noah Webster. I really think our founding fathers would be shocked at how far removed we have we we have become from God and His Word. Yeah, yeah. Plus, you know, we've gotten so far removed from the Constitution as well. Yes, yes, we have. So, you, you know, uh, it may be the case that as a nation of people, we think we've outgrown God. We don't need Him anymore. And I think about the words of Paul in Romans chapter one when he said, "Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools." And in many respects, we are playing. Uh, fool, we're playing the part of fools in this country. Hmm. Yeah, in reality, we we need God now more than ever. Yes, we do. Ben, ever. thank you so much for calling in. Appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. We have Liz on the line now. Liz, good to have you on the program. Okay. While they're getting Liz on the on the program, you referenced Deuteronomy chapter 17. One of the earmarks of the future king that would reign over Israel was that they were to keep at their side a copy of the law of God. They were to record that law and then keep it at their side and read it, study it, and meditate upon it. Think about what a difference our nation would be if those who are in political positions of power today had access to the Word of God. And, and by that I mean they kept a copy of it at their side and they diligently sought to institute what this book says into their own lives and then in terms of making policies. Mm. Look at this book. Oh, absolutely. And you know that was stated over and over by the founders at the very beginning of our country, even to the point of uh, the Continental Congress on two separate occasions during the eight years of the Revolutionary War calling for the dissemination of Bibles. And then the American Bible Society, which had as its purpose strictly to disseminate Bibles without comment or doctrinal uh, bias. Um, Many of the founders, in fact, probably 98% of the board, the original board of officers of the American Bible Society were founders of our country. Wow. That's how important they thought the Bible was. Staggering. Liz is on the line now. Liz, good to have you on the program. Thank you so much for um, taking my call. Um, I, in all of this talk, uh, I just go back to Psalms 118, verses 7 and 9. And I, I have a couple things, a question and then a comment to make right after that, and then if you'll, if you'll answer that question. Um, should we put all of our trust in fallible men who have proven to be outright, outright liars? In this, case, in this case, the main two candidates that are set before us in the Republican and Democratic parties. You stress the importance of the Supreme Court and how that will affect evangelism. First century Christians, they didn't have near the freedoms that we have given to us by whatever laws have been established to this point, and they did way more evangelism, and it seems to me we do much better when we are persecuted. Should we, could, God, like, should we not let God put us through this so we could do more for evangelism? Well, you know, I, I heard somebody say a long time ago that we do better in times of adversity than we do in times of prosperity. And typically when people are being oppressed and facing difficult situations, what do they do? They tend to look upward to God. Look at 9-11, the events that occurred in 9-11-2001. What did that do in this country? It caused people to stop and reflect upon, you know what, we need God. And you talked, you heard about people praying to God and going to worship services, etc. It was short-lived, but nonetheless it did cause people to stop and reflect upon the need for God. Yeah, we're not saying that evangelism is impossible in the context of uh, <clears throat> totalitarian type government 
Uh, of course, the first century church did not have the option mm -hmm. to go and uh, replace the leaders that were in position then. And if we ever get to that point, we ought to do what they did. In fact, we ought to do it anyway. We ought to evangelize all of the time. However, I don't think the caller is saying that uh, it would be better for Islam to take over the United States of America so that, uh, you know, suddenly Christianity comes alive. Why should it have to come to that point? I think that we do need a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. And we do need to focus on these things. And I do believe Proverbs, or excuse me, Psalm 118, which says it's better to put confidence in the Lord than to put confidence in princes or in man. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true, but that does not negate the fact that we as human beings have been told to be salt and light. That's right. And God has no hands but our hands to do His work today, we've often said. So, Who's going to stand up for the babies? Who's going to stand up for the babies? Yeah. Well, and, and you know on an individual level, though, don't you think? I mean, that, including I just, votes. I, I think yes. we, I think we, we are vote. We might hope for one thing, but mm -hmm. I mean, especially if it goes for one of those two candidates, they're mm -hmm. we're putting our trust in them. That and well, they've been proven to be liars. I'd rather put my trust in God. Okay, uh, why can't we do both? You know, God ordained government. Mm -hmm. I was going to say Romans 13. So, right. we're not putting our trust in them, we're just trying to influence right, them exactly. as best we can and as we have opportunity. That's right. exactly. and, and, and if, Daniel, someone, if someone thinks that by voting alone they're going to change this culture and this world, they're wrong. And I would never advocate that position. Having said that, if Christians have an option to vote in a country, and here's the deal, I know that both candidates have been, both candidates, not just one, both candidates have been uh, found guilty of lying at times in the past. One of them, I uh, think, more pathologically than even the other based on research, but that's a debate we're not going to have uh, here because it's subjective. But here's the bottom line. One of the candidates is promising to appoint Supreme Court justices that will stop abortion, he, that will stop abortion and be pro-constitutional candidates. The other candidate is promising to continue the slaughter of the innocents. Now, I would rather take my chances and vote for the one who's promising to stop it. And if he then lies about it or is, is not going to follow through on it, that's not my fault. I did the best I could. That's different than just not trying to stop the one who's already promised that it's going to continue right. if they get elected. That's right. Babe, do you have something? And well, may, I, may I say one more thing and then I will, I will stop it. it but, uh, sure. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Oh, may I make one more comment? Um, I've just already seen how it's hurt the current evangelism because people are looking at us as hypocrites now because we will go to town on Bill Clinton, but we won't go to town on Donald Trump or. So I just don't want to, and for the sake of one, that's not so. The other. That's not so, ma'am. Because but, but, I'm but just going is. to, I'm just going to say this boldly. I have been as much of a, a critic of the mouth of Mr. Trump as I have the mouth or the actions of Bill Clinton. But one of those two is pro partial birth abortion, stabbing a baby's skull as it's exiting the birth canal, is what happened, and Bill Clinton was for it. And uh, the other one has vowed to stop it. I'm going to take my chances to try to stop it. I don't, I don't think we have a choice. And I don't think it's an either or proposition. We talk about voting. Voting is a tremendous opportunity and privilege that we have in this country, but also we exercise our influence. Just a moment ago, somebody brought up 1 Timothy chapter 2. What are we supposed to do? Pray for our leaders. Can we be salt and light in this world? Yes. And then we are to be practitioners of righteousness based on 1 John chapter 3. So we use our influence for good. And matter of fact, you think about it, our influence, our voice may carry more weight than voting. Uh, Brother Dave. Think about the fact that um, B.J. began to touch upon this, the history of evangelism in this country. With the exception of the first century, where in the last 2,000 years have Christian missions blossomed and literally encircled the globe? And did it not emanate from right here? Yes, it did. And is it coincidental that right at the time there were those calling for returning, restoring New Testament Christianity, that's right at the time the founding was happening. 
great point. So has there not been an overall providential use of America to evangelize? That's right. So when we try to influence the politicians to keep a good atmosphere here for us to practice Christianity and promote it, That's we're right. just going along with what's been going on for 240 That's years. Right. That's right. And you know what, in the, in the grand spectrum of things, go back to the book of Daniel. And you think about Daniel being deported to Babylon at an early age, maybe 17, 18 years of age. Look at the tremendous influence he exerted in the Babylonian kingdom, mm -hmm. King Nebuchadnezzar specifically, and then later in the Medes and the Persian Empire, the influence he rose to prominence in both kingdoms, and I believe, I believe was a tremendous light for God in those kingdoms. You know, some of our viewers will remember uh, baby Jessica, uh, the incident that happened years ago when a baby had fallen down a, a drainage pipe uh, in the backyard and had gotten wedged in there and it just kept, they couldn't get her. Uh, for 57 hours, people from all different walks of life and all different religions and creeds and conduct and moral fabric came together for one purpose and that was to save that baby. That did not mean that they all endorsed every single thing the other people that were helping to rescue the baby had ever done or said. Right. That did not mean that if there was some cussing that went on by some of the workers as they were trying to rescue the baby, that the others should have stormed off and said, well, if I'm going to have to hear language like that, I will not help this child and save this child because I'm principled. Well, I'm principled too, and I don't like hearing vulgarity from either side. And I don't like seeing, uh, I'm sure there were probably even folks helping to rescue that baby that their family background might not have been all that it could have been or should have been. They might have viewed pornography on the internet for all I know. I don't know. The point I'm making is for that particular moment at that particular time, the salvation of that baby from a drainage pipe was most significant. And I'm suggesting that at this particular moment in time, the salvation of a baby in a birth canal that's trapped if it's going to stay there and be s slaughtered by an abortionist is enough for us to come together and say, let's save that baby. Amen. Amen. Liz, thank you so much for calling in tonight. Amen. Appreciate that so much. Got an email question. Has the church completely abandoned God in all of this, I would assume, in the political process? The emphasis I hear is always on voting as if all this depends on us. Do passages like Daniel chapter 4, verse 17, 25, 32, Proverbs chapter 21, 1, and Romans 13, 1, not apply anymore. Dave, how would you respond Well, it to absolutely that? does not depend upon us. God has never needed politicians to accomplish anything worthwhile. We recognize that, but as we've discussed this entire program, we are given stewardship responsibilities to exert whatever healthy, moral, righteous, gospel influence we can everywhere we can. And it's so unique for us to have the opportunity to exert influence on political leaders of a nation. Sure. And so we should do that. Well, and, and Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that that which is required of a steward is that a man be found faithful. Right. Some have suggested that Pro Proverbs 21.1 is proof that we should just kind of let this thing ride out without our participation in the process because it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Well, how far do you take that? Does that mean Solomon had no choice but to become an idolater no. because God was leading him in that channel and directing him to become such so he could accomplish his sovereign purposes? We have to maintain free moral agency. God could use a wicked king like Nebuchadnezzar to accomplish his purposes, Daniel chapter 4. He could use the Assyrians as the tool of his anger sure. against the northern kingdom, Isaiah chapter 10 among other passages mentions that. But uh, this, none of these passages mean that we don't have to be salt and light as we said at the beginning of the, the broadcast. And certainly prayer for our civil leaders is commanded and certainly ought to be availed and it can avail much, uh, but it's not the only, you can put legs on your prayers by going to the polls and saying, which is the most righteous option that I have available when it comes to some of these areas 
that the Bible outlines as being so critical to the survival of a society. Agreed. Agreed. We do tend to put a little bit of a Calvinistic slant on Daniel 4.17, Proverbs 21 and these others and act like, you know what, there's not really anything anybody can do. God's going to put in that position whoever He wants. But that cannot be what they mean. No. It's talking about that He does operate and rule in kingdoms and place men in positions <laughs> and they are uh, allowed to be there by God, but they're going to give an account. And He obviously does not endorse wicked government. We, we've even oh. taken Romans 13 and said, well, you know, we got to obey the government. Well, that passage says whenever the, the government is His deacon, His minister for good mm -hmm. and accomplishing God's will, absolutely we are to be obedient to that. Right. But we must obey God rather than men. No doubt. No doubt. We've got Judy Jones on the line with us tonight. Judy? Yes. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to, I, I need to say this. Uh, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> I've, I've uh, listened to you uh, um, tonight on the TV here, uh -huh. and um, I just got one thing to say, and that is that uh, the, uh, if they're both, if both vote, uh, elected, both Hillary and Trump are neither Christians, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they are or not, keep in mind, I'm just saying if they're not, why vote a men at all? I, I'm sorry. I, Why I vote a men at all? Oh, okay, okay, okay. May, may I ask you a question, Miss Ju Judy? Yeah. Have you ever voted in a presidential election before? Yes, I have. Okay. Did but, Did you vote for someone you know, that I'm was a Christian? That, excuse me. Did you vote for someone that was a Christian? No. But that's the whole point. They say, they, I don't know if they're Christian or not, like I said, I just know that if they're neither one are, we don't need that kind of people in office. Though. Am I right or well, not? I mean, we do need, to, would you agree <laughs> that we need, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, do you, do you, would you agree we need someone to stop the slaughter of the, the babies? Yeah. Okay. I mean, now you and I don't have you and I don't have the power available to us to enact legislation to make that come to pass, do we? By ourselves. Yeah, I mean, true. so the that only true, option they, we have to stop it is to try to put someone who's promised to stop it, mm -hmm. and that's all we can do. Right. And but what, let's just say, for just let's say for uh, for example, say. Uh, Neither one is willing to do that, even after they said they would. Uh, we, we don't have any control over what they do once they get in office. Once the person gets in office, uh, and that applies to all levels of government, it's not just true. the presidency. Sure. We're trying to put in people at every level, but we have no guarantee of what they'll do, That's and right. we don't consider any of them pure right. New Testament That's right. Christians. And, and by if, the way, if that happens, the blood would not be on my hands hmm. because I would have been taking what this candidate promised and acting, voting based on that. And if they don't right. follow through with it, that's certainly something they'll answer to God for. Oh, sure, absolutely. Judy, thank you so much for calling in tonight. Okay, Appreciate well, that very much. You. Dave, I know that you have looked at the Old Testament extensively and have come up with at least 11 basic traits that ought to be characteristic of a leader. Would, would you mind sharing some of those with us? We, uh, I combed through these, uh, you know, as, as you say in the Old Testament, just to see how many qualifications there are. And amazingly, there's a bunch of qualifications for judges mm -hmm. that are given in, our, in the Old Testament that uh, would apply on the national level. Do we have this? I think we have this on a full screen uh, image. The 11 that uh, I uh, synthesized out of all of these passages, uh, number one, they must be capable, wise, and knowledgeable. See, again, when we go into the voting booth, do we look at this person and say, is this guy capable, wise, knowledgeable? We don't even know. That's not what we've taken into account. Number two, uh, fear God. So they would have to be spiritually minded and have a genuine fear of the one true God. Uh, be truthful. Hate greed. Read the Bible regularly. You mentioned that. Deuteronomy I mean, 17. How, how can you function in a leadership capacity really in any area of life if you don't have God's thinking that's right. Uh, behind you and guiding you, uh, not be prideful. How about that one? Be obedient to God's word himself or herself. Possess a strong sense of justice. Resist lies. In other words, uh, 
not only telling them, but falling for them, being led astray. Uh, number 10, remain unaffected by those who seek to bias them or gain their favor. We, you know, it's common knowledge now. It's not even behind closed doors that, well, you know, you, you gave me a bunch of money to be elected, so now I've got to do certain things right. for you. Or we'll go in a back room. Uh, when you go into that room, you're against health care. And when you come out, you're for it. You know, right. so something's transpired sure. where people are biased and influencing in a corrupt manner. And number 11, promote what is right, discouraging sin in the land and contending with the wicked, standing up to those forces in our society that are detrimental to the health of our nation. Don't, don't you think, Dave, you look at those principles and, and the principles that are set forth in Scripture. Jeremiah said, it's not a man that walketh to direct his own steps. We need God's Word to direct our paths based on Psalm, Psalm 119. You remember when the Supreme Court passed legislation allowing gay marriage in this country and, and the White House was bathed in rainbow colors. Mm. If, if the current administration truly trembled at the Word of God, as Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 66. I don't think they would have done that. And I think that there is a total disregard for the Word of God among many of our political leaders. And you go back to our founding fathers, they truly believed that God's Word was, was what was to lead us, guide us in our thinking and, and in our daily lives. And yet, why have we abdicated that, B.J.? Right. That's, that's a fair question. And, you know, I think we, we've got to find this balance between what the passages say about God's sovereign ability and our participation. I got to thinking about the farmer. He prays for rain, but he plants a crop too. He gets out and does what he can do oh, sure. and then turns it over to the will of God as to what kind of crop he will receive. And we have to plant seeds of righteousness by voting, trying to get a good crop. And then, of course, ultimately the providential will of God is sovereign in this regard. But it's not either or. So many things that I'm hearing as people discuss these things in this election uh, seem to be uh, isolated to one thing and don't often uh, factor in all of the other aspects that I, need to be considered. I, I agree. I, I think both of you, I think both of you guys would agree with me that there is a leadership crisis in our country. Do you think possibly, Dave, that that stems from a leadership crisis in the home? And you know, we talk about as the home goes, so goes the nation. Our nation's in trouble because the home's in trouble. And, and so we have not, as a nation, cultivated leaders, particularly the kind of leaders that, that have based their lives on the characteristics that you spoke about just a moment ago. Absolutely. And notice we have a leadership crisis in virtually every category in our nation. What about the church? Do we have a Great leadership point. crisis yes, in terms of elderships and so forth? Um, but, but what has happened? You know, the World War II generation with all of their faults and flaws, nevertheless, the church was stable, doctrinally solid. It was our generation of baby boomers that came along and began to tamper with all of that. And you can just see that that's gone to seed across our civilization. And so, you know, even in schools, there's no leadership because uh, one person wants to say a prayer in school and, a, and an angry parent uh, fusses about it. And so the principal marches over to that parent or that child says, you don't do that anymore. It, there's no uh, standard that people are willing to champion and stand up and take the heat, even if they're criticized for it. True, true. Got another caller on the line, David Parsley, who is an elder in the church in Jacksonville, Florida, is on the line with us tonight. David, good to have you on the program. Well, it's good to be with y'all. I'm uh, listening to your, your your show here tonight, and I'd, I've got some uh, some concerns on this. I just want to run it by you and see what y'all sure. think here. Absolutely. Um, for years, you know, I've heard public prayers given and, and private comments made for the need for our country to turn back to God's right ways, His righteousness, and. I'm hearing now with these two candidates that, that's out there, the comments that, you know, people are going to be voting for the lesser of two evils, or they're going to have to, you know, hold their nose, turn their head, and close their eyes and cast their vote for one of these two people. And I've heard that for a while now. Well, my concern would be this. You know, Proverbs tells us righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then Joshua 24, of course, Joshua says, Choose you to stay whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Mm. And so as Christians, um, 
it's something that we need to be considering. I'll just give you an illustration, and I'll let y'all, you know, respond to it. Let's just say back uh, when our Lord and the the apostles were here on the earth, and they had the opportunity to have an election, and they had to choose between two candidates. One was a Pharisee, and one was a Sadducee, and both of those candidates supported Planned Parenthood. One candidate was for abortion and for Planned Parenthood, and the other candidate was up to just here recently for abortion, but now has changed their mind, but he still supports Planned Parenthood. Would our Lord and the apostles ever say they were going to vote for the lesser of two evils and vote for the Pharisee who they determined in their own mind that, well, he's the lesser of two evils, I'm going to vote for him because at least he believes in the resurrection. Would our Lord ever vote for the lesser of two evils? Well, the of course, the answer to that would question. be no. So as Christians, yeah. why are we so eager do that very thing and vote against the core principles of belief and obedience to God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's found in his holy inspired word for this sure. election for one of these two guys. There are other candidates out there that can be supported that have religious beliefs that are based on religion mm -hmm. and on the Constitution that are not one of these two major parties, but there are there isn't a person out there. His name is Tom Hoefling. Now, I don't know his religious background, but I do know in, in looking at his his stance on things on Facebook, that he's a religiously minded person. Right. And he is definitely 100% against abortion. He wants to abolish it. Right. I mean, so there are other choices. Well, may I but as far as question? Christians is concerned, we can at least stand up for the Lord right. and say, no, righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And I'm going to vote for the Lord. Well, yeah. partially, so what's I, your thoughts on that? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for calling in, David. Well, partially, are you still on the line? I am, yes, sir. Uh, have you ever voted in a presidential election before? Yes, sir, I have. Did you vote for a New Testament Christian? No, sir, there was none. Okay. I, I, I'll tell you what so, I voted well, for. Let me finish, let me finish here. <laughs> so they were, if they were a member of a denominational church, would that be considered a form of evil? And if they were, uh, if they were an atheist, okay, it so have you, have, haven't we all uh, in voting in any election voted for the lesser of two evils if we didn't vote for a New Testament Christian. Now, I would grant that the comparison, unfortunately, that we're faced with now is two candidates that are very, uh, very different from any we've ever had before, and that's much to our right. nation's shame. But uh, Correct. I think to be, I hear people say that they would never vote for the lesser of two evils, but frankly, we've all been doing it for years. That's true. Yeah, good point. Well, let me just say one other thing about that, what you're saying. Yes, okay. sir. That, uh, let me just say one thing about what you just asked me. Uh -huh. That is true. But for me, in all the years I've ever voted for a president, the one issue that I voted for was their stance against abortion. Okay. And I voted for that person based on that alone. Okay. I appreciate that. If they were that. Republican, yeah. which they always were, yeah. I voted sure. Republican for that one stance. Now, of course, that's not popular with the country and with the world, yeah. but I'm a Christian first yeah. and foremost. Well, and, and I, think, I think you just gave a very viable reason yeah. for voting. And Correct. And may, with the candidates right now, neither one that. of them are for. I mean, one yeah, of them well, says they one are of them, to be to be forthright. One of them, if he can be trusted, and all we Correct. can do is go on what he's saying. I know his vice presidential candidate is staunch uh, anti-abortion, and I know the Supreme Court right. justices that he says he's going to appoint would also be uh, leaning against abortion. But here's my thought. I, I wish that he were not one who had said that he uh, would approve of abortion for uh, cases of rape and incest. That's one percent, about one half of one percent of all abortions in any given year. Now, here I've got a choice between a candidate that would keep going at a million plus abortions a year, or I've got a candidate that if, if he follows through on what he's saying, would eliminate the slaughter of the innocents by 900,000 and I have to at least, for my conscience, factor that in. If I have a chance to save even 900,000 babies, I have to factor that in. I think so. I understand that. Well, let me just say one other thing and then I'll be done and I'll let y'all take another call from someone else. Does our Lord need me to vote for the lesser, one of these two candidates, lesser of two evils? Does he actually need me to vote for that or does he need me as a Christian to actually stand for him and his beliefs 
and what's found in God's holy inspired word. I think we can do both. In other words, does he need my one vote? Yeah. I think we're, why not do both? Stand for him and, in support of yeah. what the gospel says we are so yeah. supposed to do. Seek, his, seek the kingdom of, of, of God first, and all these things are going to be added to you. Yeah. His righteousness, his right ways. Yeah. So if I'm taking a stand for the Lord, whether I vote for one of these two candidates or not, the Lord knows I'm voting for the right person that's going to support him. Now, in this particular case, it's going to be a third party. Okay. It's not going to be either one of these two candidates as far as me, I'm concerned. Because I'm going to vote for a person who is at least totally against abortion hmm. and is for the Constitution. David, listen, I, I hate to cut you off. Our, our time's just about gone. Thank you so much for calling in and yes, appreciate, appreciate what you had you to say. And I, I, don't, I don't see it as an either-or situation. And look, are these my two preferred candidates? No. I, I've said before, if this is the best we have to offer for leadership in our country, I'd hate, I'd hate to see the worst, mm -hmm. but it is what it is. It is what it and is. And so we have to work with what we have and try to exert as much good as we can, where we can, when we can, as long as we can. And not voting or voting for a very good third party candidate is just a, a it, wasted vote. Well, it's as not far going as to stop abortion. Gonna, no, no, if that's the goal to stop abortion, and it ought to be, that's not going to get it done. You know, well, one other point on that, have you looked at the two main parties' platforms? Yes. They're, they're black and white. One is rabidly for abortion, one is against it. One is rabidly for homosexuality, one is against it. What, what why, is for, why would we need to go any further? I, I mean, those two issues alone, case a closed. A woman at one of the p p party's conventions this year announced she'd gotten an abortion and people gave her an ovation for it. It's you incredible. know what Americans and Christians need to realize is we don't have time for all this other political stuff. No. The Lord's going to take us down because of those two issues alone that's, probably much sooner than we think. Right. We'd better get busy campaigning against those. Well, you know those. what? You, you, you just triggered a thought in my mind. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter talked, or 2 Peter chapter 2 rather, Peter talked about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said they serve as an example to mm. all who will live ungodly. Now, if he'll take down a city, will he not take down a nation? Absolutely. Another caller on the line very quickly. Our time's gone. Dean is with us. Dean? Hey, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, BJ? It's good hey, to man. be again. Good to um, see you. I have a question. I, I am um, admittedly a undecided voter this election season because of some of the lack of leadership traits that I see. And on this specific issue of... Um, hey, Dean, Dean, Dean. Dean. Yeah. Hey, listen, if you would, call back next week. Our time's gone. We've got a minute left, and so we're going to have to cut it off. But okay. appreciate you calling in, and hey, no listen, we'll try, to, we'll try to get you next week. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Look, we could go two hours tonight. Right. <laughs> yeah, we've we got so much material, and, the, and these guys are so good. We, we've got so much material to share. You know, we're all suffering from E. SS election yes. stress syndrome. Is that what <laughs> it is? No no People it. are all worked up about this. They, they really you know, are. It's not my intention to be abrupt or hurtful in any way, but I am, like everyone else, sincerely concerned hmm. about these babies. Something's got to be done. Something has got to be done. Critical don't, don't you think Jesus would say, you need, to be, you need to be concerned about the unborn baby? And if you can exert influence on a political, national level, you ought to do it. Do it. Amen. Dave, thank you. BJ, so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Look, thank you, and hope to see you right back here next Thursday night. Until then, God bless.